Hey guys, this is Nick and welcome to your Linux and open source news fix for the first half of December. This time we have the death of CentOS as we know it, a crazy effort to port Linux to Apple Silicon, Cyberpunk working on Linux day one, sorta, and the unfortunate death of a Linux hardware seller. Let's unpack these news right after this. This video is sponsored by Linode. Founded in 2003, Linode is the largest independent cloud service provider built on open source. If it runs on Linux, it runs on Linode. Multiple distros are available, including Ubuntu, CentOS, Alpine, and of course Arch. The multiple server configurations make any app or service flexible and scalable to host a website, set up your own personal VPN, create a Nextcloud instance, host a game server, and more. Linode offers 24-7 support any day of the year, by phone or support ticket, regardless of your plan size. The simple pricing with monthly caps ensures that there is no hidden fees and a generous monthly transfer is built in, which means there is no large bill surprises like you get from AWS or Azure. Sign up today at linode.com slash Linux experiments to get your $100 in Linux server credits. The link is in the description. Oh, and before I forget, in addition to having great written documentation, Linode also just started their own YouTube channel where you can check out video tutorials and guides, information on Linux cloud computing, and guest appearances from various experts. Check them out at youtube.com slash Linode. Let's start with the Linux news. A crazy developer wants to port Linux to Apple M1 Max. For those who don't know, M1 is the name Apple gave their first system on a chip made for desktops and laptops, and it's really, really powerful and energy efficient. Hector Martin is willing to try and work on making Linux run on these pesky systems on a chip, and is raising funds to do just that. He was trying to reach $4,000 a month, and that's already reached, so he can now dedicate enough time to make that project worth it. I'll follow this closely as these M1 Macs look to be very, very interesting in terms of power consumption and performance, and running Linux in there could be a dream. CentOS, the well-loved and used server-focused distribution, is dead, or it will be soon. Red Hat announced that CentOS 8 will not see the 10 promised years of support, and will instead be terminated in 2021 to be replaced by CentOS Stream, a sort of rolling release with tested updates. This means two things. First, CentOS Stream will not be a perfect copy of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, so people using it to ensure compatibility with this other distro will probably leave it. And second, it's going to stop being a viable option for servers, period, as no one in their right mind would want to run a rolling release with regular updates on a server. You want the best uptime and the least bandwidth consumption on the server, and CentOS is definitely not answering these needs anymore. Kind of feels like a money grab to push people towards Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and whether it was IBM's doing or Red Hat's is still undetermined. Alan Poe published an interesting post retracing the steps of Snaps and the problems they were trying to solve. It starts from the six month update cycle of Ubuntu without app updates between versions barring some exceptions like web browsers, up to Ubuntu Touch and Convergence, the problems PPA introduced, the click packages designed for IoT, and finally the snap packages. The post is not a long list of compliments thrown towards snaps, and it's definitely an interesting read to see why these were created, what benefits they bring, and what problems still need to be solved with that packaging format. It's quite objective, really, and you should give it a read even if you don't like snaps. A new Linux kernel version is out, version 5.10 LTS. It's going to be supported up until 2026, which is a very huge support window. It brings a lot of performance improvements to BetterFS and X4, and has a new input-output infrastructure. It also better supports hardware monitoring for Zen 3 AMD CPUs, and this kernel supports the Librem 5 as well. This new version also supports the Nintendo Switch Joy-Cons and the Pro Controller, which is nice, and these will work with Bluetooth as well, and includes rumble, accelerometer, and gyroscope support. This version should arrive shortly on your rolling release, or will probably be the base for the next major version of other distros. Now let's move on to the open source news. Google is finally talking more about Fuchsia, and now they're expanding its open source model. Fuchsia has been an open project from the start, but they are now really building a model around the code, with a governance structure, an issue tracker, and mailing lists. They also have defined a process for would-be contributors to apply and be able to submit patches. They also published a technical roadmap, which is unsurprisingly pretty technical. 
There is no real indication about what Google will use Fuchsia for, if it's geared towards being a Linux replacement for Android or even for Google servers, but we'll be able to monitor that as the project seems now fully opened up. A survey of around 1200 free and open source software contributors found that people don't like to work on securing their code and their projects. While this isn't a mind-blowing revelation, as working on finding and plugging potential security threats is very hard work with little visible benefit for end users, it's still pretty alarming. The task was described by some contributors as soul-withering or insufferably boring, which sounds about right. The problem is, without this work on securing code bases, we risk losing the trust of a lot of companies that rely on open source to run their operations. The survey also found that male contributors are still predominant, and that about half of the respondents were paid by the employer for time they spent on open source contributions, which is interesting. Now moving on to some hardware news, System76 announced the Pangolin, their first fully AMD-based laptop. It's not available yet, but it will bring 4th gen Ryzen CPUs with AMD Radeon graphics, up to 64GB of RAM, a full HD 15.6 inch matte display, and the usual Clevo Tongfang design. It will start at $849, which seems reasonable depending on the Radeon graphics card they'll end up shipping in them. It's good to see AMD laptops finally reaching the Linux world, as these Linux retailers and manufacturers have been stuck with Intel for a long time now, and AMD is starting to really shine in the CPU and GPU department. Now, less favorable hardware news, Zarizen, a California-based Linux PC seller, is closing its doors. Any active warranty or software support will also stop, as Zarizen never reached the status of System76 or Tuxedo in terms of notoriety, and they just couldn't sustain their operations anymore. Covid was apparently the final blow to the company, and they couldn't recover. This is a sobering reminder that as healthy as the Linux hardware market seems to be right now, with more manufacturers and sellers and more devices available than ever before, it's still a pretty niche market that can't really support a huge ecosystem of companies. Now, thankfully, there's Tuxedo to pick up the slack as they release yet another laptop, but this time with a specific purpose in mind. The Tuxedo Book XP14 is designed to be a small and light gaming notebook. It's using Intel 11th Gen CPUs and Intel XE graphics, which are their new sort of dedicated graphics that should perform a lot better than the previous integrated graphics. Obviously, you can also upgrade to a GDX 1650 for more power. The 14-inch display has a 120Hz refresh rate, although it's probably not going to be usable in many games, even with the Nvidia option. This laptop will start at 865 euros, so about 950 dollars. Now moving on to the gaming news, version 1.7.3 of DXVK was released. The DirectX 9, 10 and 11 to Vulkan translation layer isn't quite finished yet and brings support for new interfaces introduced in Windows 10 and the usual fixes and optimizations to improve performance or avoid crashing. It also fixes bugs for EverQuest 2 and Trine 4. I'd expect more work to focus on VKD3D in the future, as it's the layer that translates DirectX 12, which is the main graphics API recent games target nowadays. But DXVK is still a crucial element for Linux gaming, as it enables playing an enormous back catalogue of titles. Wine 6.0 is on the horizon, and it had its first and second release candidates during the last two weeks. The major numbering change from the 5.x series to version 6 doesn't seem to mean anything special in terms of codebase, as Wine will keep on building up on Vulkan improvements, converting executables to the PE format for better compatibility, and a lot of other performance improvements and bug fixes. We can probably expect Proton to shift to version 6 once it's based on the first complete release of Wine 6.0. Now, speaking of Proton, Valve released version 5.13-4, specifically made to make Cyberpunk 2077 run. Well, it can run if you have the latest Mesa compiled from Git and an AMD GPU. On Nvidia GPUs, it does run pretty well, at least on my machine, but you'll get complete freezes of the game regularly, as Valve actually implemented a new Vulkan extension that the Nvidia driver doesn't support as of now, but that they were able to add to the Mesa drivers for AMD GPUs. 
If you really want to play Cyberpunk on Linux though, I'd recommend you use Proton Experimental, which brings additional fixes for the audio and the facial animations in this game. VKD3D Proton version 2.1 was released. This DirectX 12 to Vulkan translation layer fixes a bunch of bugs and improves GPU-bound performance, notably for The Division, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Cyberpunk 2077 again, Death Stranding, Horizon Zero Dawn, and others. It also should improve performance in Unreal Engine 4 titles. It should be brought into the next release of Proton as it's their go-to translation layer for DirectX 12 titles. And let's complete with some Firefox news. Firefox 84 was released without much new in the features department. It seems it's mostly a release to bring native compatibility to M1 Max, which we don't care about on Linux, but it will also enable web render by default when run on GNOME-based X11 Linux desktops. Now it won't be enabled by default on any other desktop environment or on Wayland yet. And as you might expect, I tried to enable it again on my Elementor OS NVIDIA powered desktop and it doesn't work at all, breaking all the web pages I tried to display by displaying an immovable colored bar on top of the page. I hope Firefox can bring web render to all Linux machines soon as it's a boon in terms of performance and it could really make Firefox catch up to Chromium based browsers, at least in terms of usability. And that's it for this video guys, I hope you enjoyed, if you did don't hesitate to like or dislike if you didn't. You can also subscribe and turn on notifications if you want to see more videos like this one. And if you really want to help support the channel, you can join my amazing Patreon subscribers and YouTube members and get access to a weekly Patreon cast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!